greeting again in that enduring name of Jesus. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Lord, I thank you for your word today. We ask God that you open our hearts and minds and give us understanding because our carnal minds do not receive the things of the Spirit of God. They're actually foolishness to us. So Jesus, give us what we need to understand and apply to our lives because you're the vine, we're the branches. Without you, we can really do absolutely nothing. And we like it like that, Jesus. We want to depend on you, and we do. Give us your word now, Father, out of the book of Colossians. In your name, Lord, amen. The book of Colossians is quite a powerful book. Theologically, it answers a lot of questions. Uh, it deters a lot of people from getting confused and falling into error that we don't need to fall into. As a matter of fact, if you're a Bible reader, you don't need to fall into any error. If you don't read your Bible, you're going to be vulnerable to every slight of wind of doctrine that's blowing around out there. And there's quite a few. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, if you read the book of Colossians, average speech, about 150 words per minute. Uh, you could read it out loud in 12 minutes. <laughs> so there's not that much to it. But uh, theologically, it's really packed. Spiritually, it is an A-bomb. Okay, so or hydrogen bomb or cobalt or whatever <laughs> we've developed since the old days. Okay, uh, read it though. Please read it. We're going to go through it now. Paul is um, pretty much Paul wrote three kinds of letters. Uh, he wrote personal letters. He wrote occasioned letters. Uh, not occasional, occasion, there was a reason why he wrote it. He was answering a particular question. Um, and he also wrote general letters like to Ephesus. That was just a general letter to the churches. Probably as far as Ephesus, maybe a hundred something miles was Laodicea to the east of that. So um, uh, that might answer some questions for us as we'll see in just a minute. Anyway, uh, let's talk about Colossae. Colossae is a town, uh, it was actually a tri-city area. There was Laodicea, there was Hierapolis, and there was um, Colossae. And they were, towns sort of grew together, and they were very prosperous, very wealthy. They had a lot of uh, good land for agriculture, so sheep wool was there. Um, it was a wealthy place. It was well-to-do. And this, of course, attracted cross-culturalism. We had a lot of people from the different cultures. It's at a crossroads. So they came there and settled down because there was money to be made. It used to be the home of the Phrygians, and then the Greeks moved in. Uh, about 200 BC, Antiochus the Great actually sent 2,000 Jews to the area, and uh, from Babylon and Mesopotamia into the regions of Libya and uh, Phrygia, because, hate to do the stereotype, but he thought the Jews would be good economically. They would get things going money-wise. And so by the time um, this letter is written, there's an easy 50,000 Jews living in the area. So it's multicultural, which has its advantages and disadvantages, but the huge disadvantage is that it's pluralistic. And uh, pluralism, well, Okay, let me say that. Pluralism in the United States is good because if you leave Christianity, that we don't chop your head off like Muslims or like Islam requires, you know, or Hinduism or anything like that. We actually permit people to have different belief systems. <coughs> Sorry. And really, so does God as far as that goes. You can believe in anything you want. Uh, you can also have the consequences of it, okay? So, but... The religions of Colossae were very, or Colossi, were very uh, pluralistic and something very dangerous and very common, and it's happening today, happened to the Christianity of this town. It got polluted. It got compromised. Uh, there were other things entering into it, um, like liberal Judaism, sort of, not really the orthodox kind um, that Paul was raised under when he sat at the feet of Gamaliel, but rather we've got a kind of diverted, polluted, not polluted, well, yes, it is polluted, but it's a diluted version, watered down um, of liberal Judaism. We have astrology. 
um, Ammonism, which is about, well, I'll tell you in just a minute, uh, mystery religions, all the Roman gods were there. There was a legalism, which ca came in with Judaism, and there was aestheticism, the worship of angels, and a lot of Gnosticism, okay? And there are a number of people mentioned in this letter, and we're going to get to that just out of the protocol for what's called uh, inductive Bible studies. It's good to know he's with Timothy here. I'll tell you who Timothy is later. Uh, Tychicus, and there's some different um, people. There's Demas with them. There's uh, Luke. Um, Onesimus is with them, who was a runaway slave. And if you read Philemon, you know about that. Uh, Aristarchus was there. At the end, he goes on and he lists the whole plethora of people. And one of the reasons for this is because Paul did not actually know uh, the Colossians. He didn't found the church. Epaphras, his friend who was a convert of his, uh, founded the church. <coughs> I'm sorry about this cough. And uh, he came back to Paul and he said, well, we got a group of believers there. Here's what's going on with them. And then he came back and said, but there's something really uh, a problem here. They kind of dropped the guard down and it's not Jesus only or uniquely, but we're starting to let in, they're starting to let in astrology and uh, modern age thinking is coming in here and it's, it's just not, it's not very good for them. Well, what happens uh, when all these different things come in, you cannot necessarily identify it as, well, Paul says, well, I, I know what that is. I'm going to preach against it. That's Nazi, that's Gnosticism. And here's my chapter on that astrology, this won't work, and uh, dietary things, and, you know, the wondering where the stars are and observance of days and things like that. Paul is simply going to uh, write a letter because Epaphras has given him a whole list of stuff, and it really falls under what we call syncretism. Syncretism is the mixing of Christianity with other things. Now, Paul would have gone there, but he was in prison. He was under house arrest. This was his first imprisonment. And uh, Paul wrote several letters. If, if he couldn't visit, he wrote a letter, okay? And he would write a letter uh, from prison, which were known as his prison epistles. <laughs> but Colossae was a town that had a whole mix of stuff. Um, animism was there. And that is the belief that natural objects, natural phenomenon... Uh, the universe itself possess souls, okay? Uh, it, it attributes the powers of nature and spirit, like they'll say that there's a spirit of the river, a spirit of the forest, a spirit of different things, which is, by the way, reappearing in the green movement. Um, it's a maternal worship of nature, mother nature, mother earth. These things are also, and if you really want to look at the history of this, it's uh, Wiccan, or actually Wiccan came later, or they kind of evolved at the same time, but it's a nature-oriented religion, okay? And I'm not confusing with witchcraft as the work of the flesh in Galatians chapter 5 that we can discuss at a different time. That's using mental, intellectual power for contact of spirits. But under plain old Wiccan witchcraft, amonism, we're thinking that uh, there's spirits around here talking to us guiding, leading, and of which uh, is also astrology, but not necessarily that of rivers and plants and trees and forests, but it's the stars. That, that was the study that um, assumes and attempts to interpret the influence of the heavenly bodies on human affairs. This was closely associated with angelic worship. They believed that angels were also involved sort of uh, as anons or intermediates between God and man that could uh, straighten things out. Astrology became a big problem in the church at Colossae, okay? And we know the story in Daniel where the king was looking for someone to interpret his dream, and he brought in all of the uh, astrologers and soothsayers. They couldn't give him any interpretation, so they were futile. And in the book of Isaiah, the prophet actually mocked it before the king. He said, call in your astrologers, your stargazers, your monthly prognosticators, and uh, see if they can deliver you or tell you how to get out of your problem. Well, they're absolutely worthless. And one of the things is that astrology is, um, not only is it 
pointless and uh, mute or moot, if you want to say that. Uh, it's offensive. It's offensive to God because God wants to be the one to direct our lives. God wants to be the one who gives us instruction. Lo, I come in the volume of a book. It is written of me to do thy will, O God. Where? In the volume of a book it is written of me. So God has given us his precious, precious word for guidance, for instruction and in righteousness, that the man of God may be whole, perfect, entire, wanting nothing. That's why we study to show ourselves approved on the God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, but rightly dividing the word of truth. His word is a light unto our feet. It's a lamp unto our path. I mean, I could go on and on with what the word of God is, but the word of God was made flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father. Now, we know that this person to be Jesus, John said, our eyes have seen him, we've witnessed him, our hands have handled him, we've touched him, we've listened to him. This is not just a, an ethereal thought or an idea. Jesus Christ, the anointed, the incarnate, was here with us. And he showed us by example. He taught us by words. And this is what we need to be looking unto Jesus as the author and the finisher of our faith. Not to the stars, not to, uh, not to any of these things, observance of calendar days or whatever, okay? Um, mystery religions were also very big in in in. Uh, Colossi at that time. <coughs> I really apologize for this cough, but I just have it until God takes it away. Uh, but mystery religions were all kinds of, uh, they had secret, well, they had knowledge. Huh? I know something you don't know, which really, if you're a Christian in Christ, there's nothing else that can be known. The entire fullness of the Godhead bodily is in Christ. So Paul is looking at this and said they're into initiations, uh, cults, which is supposed to give you some kind of special benefit into salvation. And uh, Jesus is the one that gives it all. You don't need the benefit from any secret knowledge or Gnosticism. Gnostic is, it means knowledge. These religions uh, thought that they could, or these religious people thought that they could be saved because of some kind of knowledge. Well, that's not only arrogant and, you know, incorrect. It's fodder to people that love to uh, put themselves up as intellectuals, conceit. It feeds, it feeds the proud conceit of individuals who like to hold themselves in high esteem. There was also a deviation of Judaism, which I mentioned before. It had become liberal, intellectual, immoral, and it was a problem. There was a problem with false doctrine in the church, okay? And false doctrine results in bad conduct, bad, bad Bible, bad doctrine, bad conduct. And Epaphras comes back and says, Paul, here, this is what's happening. So Paul says, okay, syncretism has got to go. Let me tell you what syncretism is. It's the attempted reconciliation or union of, the, um, of different or opposing principles, practices, or parties like, like as in philosophies and religions. Syncretism had developed um, a mixture of religions in the church. And uh, it brings additions to Christianity. You can't really say it's a cult or a heresy. Um, it's more like uh, it's not an organization. It's not, it doesn't have a headquarters or a real creed. It's just sort of a uh, tolerance of permissiveness. It's um, a mood where that people are willing to say, okay, well, that's nice. We're Christians, but we want... Uh, we want you to feel good about yourself and your beliefs, so we're going to tolerate that. And the mixtures come in, and they always obscure Christ. This is spiritual warfare. This is not just being nice or intellectual academia, okay? If you bring in anything, mix it with the mix it with the mixture, you dilute the wine. You just, it, it just not, you obscure the person of Jesus Christ. So what happens uh, in order for people to frantically regain what they sense they've lost, but they don't know what they did, is Christianity goes from a relationship with Jesus into a religion, okay? It transforms your faith in him into a ritual, um, uh, a system, uh, ideology, a uh, culture, um, it, it just does a lot of damage. You start looking for things to replace uh, because you're missing something, okay? It makes the eminence of God, uh, which is his high station, it makes the emin 
the eminence or the nearness of God inaccessible. It's like, okay, he's not concerned anymore. He's not around. He doesn't matter. Sort of like the God that made the creation wound up the clock and walked away and he might come back. He might not. He did his job. It puts God out of touch. It also makes the preeminence or the superiority of Christ too low. Jesus just becomes one of the boys. He becomes one of the many uh, like Muhammad or maybe Mahatma Gandhi or maybe uh, Buddhism or Shintoism or one of the other gurus of you know the world. There are many. Jesus, by the way, is entirely, completely unique. And Paul's writing to the, a people that really need to get this straight. For there's one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. You're looking around at different religions. Stop it. There is no other well, well, no, there are religions, but there's only one name given among men under heaven whereby you must be saved, and that's the name of Jesus. All right, so Jesus is not just one of the many saviors. He's the only savior. He that denies that Jesus is the Christ, he's antichrist, okay? Muhammad is antichrist. Islam is antichrist. Okay, well, it also, syncretism will regulate your behavior. Um, and your behavior as a Christian, well, it should be that you're dead, I'm sorry, but uh, dead people don't require much, and they're running around thinking, we can't touch this, we can't taste that, we can't hear this, we can't, okay. And Paul is saying, look, you're, you're, you're a people who are confused about the position that you are in Christ. You're buried with him in baptism, which we're going to hit as we read through the text, okay? They observe calendars, special days. Now, let me say this. If you want to have a special day, Easter, Christmas, I don't know, Whatever it is, that's fine, as long as you do it under the Lord. But I want you to know that if you don't do it, that's also fine because there is no record, no record, no record in the entire New Testament of any calendar observation, okay? You say, uh, well, you know, well, what about the Sabbath or Sunday or first day of the week? No, it's, it, it's according to each man's ability. It doesn't, there is no uh, requirement for you to observe, <coughs> excuse me, any calendar day. It's not there in the New Testament at all. Okay, and there was another thing, uh, abstinence of body b or uh, bodily pleasure. They say, well, this, we shouldn't do this. We can't do this. They would abstain from marriage. They would abstain from meats. All kinds of things were going on to show uh, Ramadan. Islam does the same thing. We're, go we're not going to eat all day. We're going to gorge at night, but we're going to make ourselves suffer. They even have... Um, Rituals and not just Islam alone. I'm not just picking on that 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 political religion uh, Or well, these are cults as far as I'm concerned because I'm a Christian um, but they beat themselves with whips and uh, But that's not unique to them for some reason. There's a form of self a peace self uh, pleasure There's a psychological appeasement in self-inflicted sufferings. People feel good about making themselves suffer. Now, not only, you know, pagans like Muslims, but um, the monk, Martin Luther, who was a Catholic, uh, he prayed to three saints every single day. He flogged himself, or, or that is, he beat himself with whips until he went unconscious. Um, he went on several pilgrimage, he's, or pilgrimages. He, he, uh, he, he climbed the holy steps in Rome, not on his feet, on his knees. Um, why? To atone for the sin in his life. And then all of a sudden, just one day, he quit. So his superior came to him and said, Martin Luther, if you take away the relics and the uh, pilgrimages and the prayers to the saints and all your devotional practices, what are you going to put in their place? And Martin Luther gave the answer and simply said, Christ. Well, that started the Protestant Reformation, okay? So here we go, that Christ is the only thing you really need. Out of a, you, you can skip the jazz. Let's get right to the quick. His name is Jesus. He is everything you could ever want, desire, think, dream, hope of. He is the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. He's the bright and morning star. He is the Rose of Sharon. He's everything you could dream of. He's Jesus. All this other stuff, I'm sorry, uh, Colossians, you're wasting your time, and you're obscuring the real hero of all this, and his name is Jesus, okay? God says, now have no other gods. The first commandment, have no other gods before me. 
So idolatry is forbidden, you know, idolatry. And I don't just mean bowing down to a wood carved or a stone carved idol or a little picture of a man or something like that. I mean the worship of nature, the, uh, in, the, uh, the worship of spirits or the, um, oh, what's that, uh, um, seancing with spirits, the stars, the knowledge. Uh, I mean knowledge in its form like I know something, so now I'm going to go somewhere with it. It's idolatry, right? Christ is the complete only Savior. So the message is not complicated. Stop all the complicated stuff. It's not that difficult. His name is Jesus. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn of me. I'm meek and lowly in heart. You don't have to be a PhD. You don't have to climb stairs on your knees or crawl on glass or go without food or whip yourself or you don't have to ask the stars, the rivers, the trees or eat special food or, you know, be circumcised or follow the rules of Judaism. I'm it. I'm the whole package. Everything you need. Okay, so you can scratch all the other stuff. I'm Jesus. I'm the creator of the universe. I'm the conqueror and the Lord of all the powers of heaven and earth. I am the controller, the head of the church. Okay, who sets that? It's not a smokestack or the wind by blowing it one way or the other. God is the one who sets up the head of the church, and the head of the church is Christ. Okay, so all human focus should be and must be on the exalted person of Jesus Christ, their purity, their charity. Okay, and then um, another thing that Paul goes into at the end of the third chapter, and as I said, the fourth is kind of, since Paul didn't know the Colossians, there's a lot of names listed there, and we might get through that if time permits, but he comes into a different subject uh, about wives and husbands, and then he says children and parents. And then he says, um, slaves and masters. Okay, and in each one of those, God is not setting a pecking order. There is what we would call an order, but it's not a pecking order, okay? Uh, each one of these, the wives, husbands, the children, the parents, the servants, the, or the slaves and the masters, there is a relational responsibility in which we have to give account before God, okay? And when you understand that the whole thing is about relationships, so many things become clear. It's not, I'm the boss because I'm the man and you're the... And you're the the uh, the doormat because you're the woman. It's not just that you're the child and you're the nothing and I'm the I'm the tyrant because I say so and that's the only reason you need to hear. It's not that I'm the slave and you're the master. I bought you and you do what I tell you and I own you. It's not those 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 types of attitude don't belong to Christianity. Okay, uh, they really don't. People say. Uh, Un, un, unknowing people, worldly people, heathen, pagan, ignoramus people say that, that Christianity is endorses slavery and kept it going for many years. Uh, there, is, there is responsibility in everything. So he says, wives, love your husbands, and uh, husbands, love your wives. And so everything you realize in God, if you realize that he is God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, you can connect those dots by the power of the Holy Ghost and realize, whoa, there is a relationship going on here. And relationships are the only thing that lasts. Heaven and earth will pass away. God's word, his spoken word from his heart, who he relates. You don't speak words to nothing. You don't just stand against the wall and say a bunch of words. And if you feel like you do, well, then we make fun of that. Well, yeah, I'm talking to the wall. I might as well talk to the wall. It means it's pointless. Well, God doesn't do frivolous, pointless uh, things without a reason. When God spoke his word, his word had a purpose. And the purpose is relationship. Okay, so Christ saves us. This relationship with Christ will save us from the religion of Christianity. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God. And Timotheus, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ, which are at Colossae, Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love which ye have to all the saints. 
for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof ye heard before. Uh, let me just mention about this, the hope. Okay, the hope is the hope of the second coming, that Jesus is coming back. They had heard before, by the way, when he says, which you've heard before, before all the syncretism took a hold of the church and all the outside world crept in and uh, opaqued or obscured the person of Jesus Christ, they had heard the pure, unadulterated gospel from Epaphras, who was converted by Paul in Rome, and then he went back to Colossae to, to see his friends or whatever, but started a church there. He shared his faith there. So they had heard, heard it before, and there's a hope laid up for them. The hope is the return of Christ. And I know that not many people even talk about it. Jesus is coming again. Jesus is coming again. I don't know how many ways I can say it, but Jesus is coming again. This is my hope. Okay, I don't have hope in this world. I don't have hope in this life only. If I do, then Paul said, I'm of all men most miserable. And Brother David says, I am of all men most miserable. This is not it. And I, I have a good in my life, by the way. I've not been beaten and stoned and left for dead and shipwrecked a day in the night in the deep. I haven't suffered at all for Jesus, honestly. <coughs> and excuse me again. Okay, uh, but I'm looking for Jesus to come back. He is my hope. And uh, hope that is hope that is seen is not really hope. For what does it yet? Why why does a man hope for that which he sees? So I'm saved now, but I have a hope that Jesus is coming right now. I have faith right now. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. But uh, I'm also saved by hope, and that is the hope that's laid up for me. And Paul says, "For you in heaven, whereof ye heard before." That is before all the junk came in, the false teachings and the. Uh, spots in your feast of charity, the clouds without water, the trees twice plucked up by the fruits and dead, the people that bring in garbage into the church, okay? Syncretism is garbage. The world is garbage. To be a friend of the world is to be an enemy of God. I'm sorry. Okay, uh, but you've heard the word. You Colossians had heard the word of truth of the gospel, which is come unto you as it is in all the world. Okay, it's universal. It's absolutely for every person. Okay, there is nobody elected to be damned. It doesn't happen like that. As it doth also in you since the day ye heard it and knew the grace of God in truth. Isn't it wonderful that the truth, how, boy, I could go on about the truth. It's, it's the truth. What a what a mark, what a meter, what a landmark, okay? And he said, the truth as you have learned of Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ, who also declared unto us your love in the Spirit. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you be filled with knowledge. It's interesting, the word he uses for knowledge is um, super knowledge because he knows that Gnostics are going to hear this. Oh, we have knowledge. We know We know all about you know, special rites and words and uh, mason tricks and things to get you into certain pledges and cults and initiations. Paul uses the word epinostic, which is uh, super knowledge. So take that. You just got some knowledge, Gnostics. Jesus goes way above knowledge. And uh, there's an interesting thing in... Um, Oh, who was it? The dumb ox of Italy. He was called uh, Thomas Aquinas about the knowledge of God. If you ever have, have a chance to read Summa Theologia, read it. There's some very uh, interesting stuff. But I will say this, even though Thomas Aquinas is an incredible, impeccable genius, and I mean that a lot of people say they're geniuses or say so-and-so is a genius. You don't know what genius is. I've known... Uh, at least one genius, and uh, pr probably three geniuses in my life. They're very unusual people. And uh, But Thomas Aquinas was a true genius. <laughs> if you've been born again from above, then guess what? You, have, you can be strengthened with all might according to his glorious power, and it's not you. You can far surpass anything in this world, anything. Any boundary and limitation is gone when we're in Christ, okay? Unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness. And here's a man who uh, knew something about joyfulness because he was looking down the throat of certain death many, many times, okay? Giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us, uh, made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who had delivered us from the power of darkness and hath transformed us into... Um, into the kingdom of his dear son. 
And uh, this was not a journey that we even knew. We didn't even know how to find the road to get there, but he brought us in, in whom we have redemption through his blood. I want to say one thing, that by the law, um, almost all things were required to be uh, uh, um, propitiated through blood sacrifice. For without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. Almost all things by the law are purged with, with, with blood, for without the shedding of blood is no remission of sin. I wanted to make this perfectly clear that the redemption that we have in Christ was through his blood. And the reason I'm saying that is because many Christians and even associates of mine believe that there was additional suffering required. It's called Jesus died spiritually, is that he went down to hell and he had to pay a spiritual death to, to uh, cancel out the spiritual debt of sin, which is spiritual. And I want you to say that the redemption was not continued in hell. Jesus either went to hell victorious or he went in derrota. He went, he went, in, um, he went in defeat, either victory or defeat. Christ on the cross, after he said, it is finished, it is accomplished, it is complete, it is done, that was on the cross, it was finished. From that time on, victory, victory, victory. There was no more defeat. The, the, worst, the worst thing in the world, the wages of sin is death, had been paid for. Okay, and then he said, Father, into thy hands commend I my, commend I my spirit. And he did that. So the redemption, the forgiveness of sins, it's in the blood, through his blood. He did not continue to sacrifice. And I say that because very popular, famous uh, word of faith teaches, teachers say that he had to go down and suffer and die uh, a spiritual death. God, the Son, Jesus was verily God and verily man, and God never died. God has never been dead, okay? And the person who is reborn is the same person, okay, who created the heavens and earth. It's him. By him all things consist. Even the forgiveness of sins, uh, he's the image of the invisible God. So Paul is saying, whatever you're looking for in your tea leaves and tarot cards and stargazing and, and figuring out what dreams are all about and all these little signs and initiation cults, he said, you are wasting your time get out of it, drop it, take that garbage and go home, okay? Jesus Christ is the image of the invisible God, the express image, Hebrews calls him. He's the firstborn of every creature. And by the way, when it said he's the firstborn of every creature, I've had Jehovah Witnesses knock on my door and show me this verse and say, see, this means he has to be a creature and not the creator. But if, if if you go down a few more verses, it's self-explanatory. Jesus is the creator. The firstborn is in regards to something we're going to read, which Paul is going to talk about in just a minute. For by him and Jesus, all things were created. Okay, how can you be a creature and by, and by you, you create all things? Okay, you're running, into, um, you're running into contradictions here if you think that Jesus is not divine, is not an eternal being God divinity. Okay, for by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, okay? The things, the angels, the thrones, the dominions, the powers, the principalities, all things were created by him and they're for him. Oh, I thought the gospel was for me. I'm sorry that we have somehow taken a, a left-hand turn and figured that everything that God did was really all about us and that he just simply endowed us with superpowers so we can be uh, self-lavished in our own conceit and desires and somehow make the world jealous because we have it all and they should be envious so they should be Christians too. That's a false gospel. All things were created by him and for him. Very simple. For him. Two words, very short. For him. But it will change the theology of the world. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. There's no other reason for them to be held together other than him. He's the head of the body, the church. Who can make him the head? Only God makes him the head. Who is the beginning the firstborn from the dead. Oh, that firstborn. Oh, oh, oh. I didn't read that far. Yeah, he's the firstborn from the dead. He is raised. He is resurrected. God 
Not he himself, but God brought him back from the dead. Here we go. Lazarus was resurrected, but not like Jesus, okay? Uh, the widow woman of Nain, her son who died, Jesus raised him from the dead. I'm sorry, but he died again, okay? He died later on. Everybody who was, you know, Talitha Kumai, uh, you know, daughter I say unto thee, arise. Well, she arose, but she also died again. We have, um, you know, Peter raised the dead. Uh, Dorcas, they all cried and looked at her stuff she had sown and things like that. She was raised from the dead, but she died again. Even the man who they threw his body, the dead soldier that was killed, they threw his body in a hole where Elijah's bones were. Well, he jumped out. He revived. These people have resuscitated and revived, okay? There is only one person who is, in this sense, resurrected or firstborn from the dead, the first up, and that's Jesus. He is the resurrection, and he has bodily, physically, tangibly resurrected from the dead. Okay, that why? That in all things he might have the preeminence, the superiority. For it pleased the Father that in him <coughs> should all fullness dwell. Excuse me. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, there we go, peace through how? His sufferings off in nether netherland? No, by the blood of the cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him, Paul says, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven, that and you that were sometimes alienated, Colossians, and enemies in your mind, Gentiles, by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh, through death, to present you holy and unblameable, unreprovable in his sight, if, if ye continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which ye have heard. If ye continue in the faith. Now, I understand the Hebrew or the Greek text of that. Erge, I know that there is a uh, it may be used as since you continue in the faith, since you're grounded and settled, since you have not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which you have heard. But the whole purpose of this letter is not to re reaffirm and confirm that they're on the right path. Paul is giving a warning. There is other stuff creeping in. And after he gives this list and continues to itemize it and categorize it later on, he's saying that if, not since, if, you can have your choice. If you want to appease your, your um, Reformed theology, then just throw in since there and think that, well, since I changed the word if to since, I can change the Bible to anything I want to make it fit. And I do have to concur, since can be a possible word in that. But, but hermeneutically, when you look at the context of the letter, we're not talking about uh, something that's going to be that if this is not, the other would have been. No, Paul is advising them. This is, an ad this is a warning, okay? If you, be, if, if you continue in the faith grounded and settled and be not removed away from the hope of the gospel, which you have heard, uh, which was preached, unto every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. Okay, so it's straight, it's parejo, it's level, it's for everybody, every creature. The gospel is a universal message. And Paul is saying, I'm, I'm a minister. Now, let me go into this because this, is, this can get very, very, um, it can be very difficult to un understand unless you really look at the context of the letter. He says this, he says, who now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is his church. What? Paul saying he rejoices in the sufferings for you and fills up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ. You mean Jesus left something out? There's something that Jesus didn't get done? No wrong. Strike one, strike two, strike three. Okay, why would you even go there? 
What letter, where do you see Paul's character jockeying for position ever that he is some kind of vicarious savior of the world and not Jesus? This is a man that's giving his life for the gospel. He's not usurping the person of Jesus Christ. Okay, now that, I, now that it should be very plain to you what he's not saying, let me tell you what he is saying, okay? He's saying, he's saying simply this. My imprisonment for Christ is not a light thing. It's not, it's not easy, okay? This is, this is a very grueling trial. Uh, this is a difficult thing. It's not small. I'm going to lose my life for the gospel. So he's saying my imprisonment for Christ, my suffering for Christ, is not a small thing. But, but in the big picture, it's worth it. Okay, in the big eternal picture, fine. I am perfectly happy. I am perfectly willing to suffer here and now for the gospel of Jesus Christ because I'm chained for the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm in prison for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Um, didn't Jesus himself say that we would be hated by the world for his name's sake? Did, didn't Jesus say that we would... Uh, you know, have all kinds of, in the world you shall have tribulation, but in me you shall have peace. Is this a surprise or a shock? Paul is saying, I'm not shocked at all, okay? I'm suffering for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Why? Because I just wear the word Christian on my t-shirt and that's it? No. I'm ministering, exhorting, attending to the needs of the churches, their lacks, their deficits, their afflictions, their problems, whatever. I'm being spent for the church. My life is going to be cut short. Why? Because I'm ministering to the church. It's okay. It's fine. The big picture, I'm perfectly happy with it, okay? Exhorting and attending to any of the needs of the churches. Why in the world would I do that? I'll tell you why, because the church is the body of Jesus Christ, okay? The church is the body of Jesus Christ. So, now, that's my paraphrase. Let me go on to the next verse here. He says, whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. Even the mystery. Now, I know I'm writing to Gnostics and they're reading this too and you're reading it out loud to them in church. Churches were, letters were read out loud in church. <coughs> Excuse me. Even the mystery which has been hid from ages. You talk about little secret cliquish sayings and I know this about that and therefore I'm a special, I have a special revelation You've got nothing compared to the mystery which has been hid from the ages and from generations, and now it is made manifest to his saints. Okay, the, you, you can come out of the closet. It's being shouted from the housetop. Whatever you're doing in secret, everybody is seeing. The mystery is out now, okay? It is, it, well, it's Christ in you, the hope of glory, but we're going to go there. To whom God would make known what is the riches of, of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Bang, you've got it. That is the most fabulous, incredible bit of information you could ever appropriate into your life. Paul is saying, whom we preach, warning every man. Why do you warn people? Because they could not get it, okay? I'm warning you, I'm warning you and teaching every man in all wisdom. Wisdom means that you actually get them to do it. That we may present every man perfect or mature in Christ Jesus. Whereunto I also labor, striving according to his working, which works in me mightily. Okay, so I'm putting a lot of effort into it, but I want you to know something. You can never put any effort into anything that God did not give you the ability to put the effort in for. Okay, and Paul's saying, yeah, okay, I'm knocking myself out for you. I'm working doubly hard for you. But you know what? The only reason I can work doubly hard is because Jesus gave me the ability. So he's not, he's not jockeying for position. He's not trying to get above Jesus here. For I would that you knew what great conflict I have for you and for them at Laodicea, or possibly, like I said, Ephesus, the people that he wrote the letter to. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and uh, 
for them at Laodicea, for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, that their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love and unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding to the acknowledgement of this mystery of God, the mystery of God, and of the Father and of Christ in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So it's not going to come out in your diet. You're not going to get it because of a calendar day or the position of the stars. It's not going to be revealed to you by Mother Nature or Mother Earth. Okay? Don't fall for any of that stuff. I'm telling you, and I say this, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. For though I be absent in the flesh, yet I'm present, yes, yet I'm with you in the spirit. I have the spirit of God. I'm joined in beholding your order, the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. This is exciting. And by the way, this is not astral projection. As some teachers have said, astral projection uh, is demonic and from hell. And it's false, just like every other thing that the devil throws at us. He says that as ye have therefore received Christ Jesus, the Lord, so walk ye in him. Okay, how did they receive it? Just like Epaphras told you, really simple. Be rooted, which means put your roots down, be built up in him and established in the faith, which means you got to get strong and not be blown about by every wind of doctrine and every foo-foo heresy that comes blowing through your church as you've been taught abounding therein with thanksgiving. So he says, beware, beware, take heed, protect yourselves, lest any man spoil you through philosophy, vain deceit, after the traditions of men, after the rudiments of this world, and not not after Christ. Because in Christ dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Everything you need is included in the person of Jesus. Ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power, in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands because there were Judaizers in there who were saying, well, you need to follow the law of Moses in order to be a good Christian. Uh, you gotta, you got to uh, follow these rules, okay? But Paul says you don't have to be circumcised, but you can be circumcised with the circumcision made without hands in the putting off of the body of sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. You're buried with him in baptism, wherein also you're risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who raised him from the dead. He didn't raise himself from the dead. There again, why do I emphasize it? Because it's an important, it's an important infrastructure in your life. You being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh hath he quickened or made alive together with you or with him having forgiven you of all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances. Have you ever been told to make a list of all the sins that you ever committed and come and nail it up on a post? Well, yeah. Okay, it's symbolic. It's representative of something that really has already happened, though. It didn't happen at the time you did it. You may have finally dawned or the light came on and connected the dots and, hey, I get it now. But all the handwriting of ordinances that was against you, all the crimes that you had committed against... God and man, um, which was contrary to us, the scripture says, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And having spoiled the principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly. In other words, the demonic forces of this world, the antichrist movement that is against us, Jesus has put them to open shame. He triumphed, triumphing over them in it. So therefore, as far as people trying to deceive you. Let no man therefore judge you in your meat, in your drink, in respect of a holy day, of a new moon, of the Sabbath days. These things are just shadows of things to come, but the body is of Christ. So let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility. Oh, that gives such credibility when people say, well, I don't know why God chose me, but I have to tell you this. You know what? If it's not in the Bible, forget it. If you can't give me a chapter and verse, then go talk to somebody else. I'm not interested, okay? Well, uh, and worshiping of angels. Oh, but angels, aren't they heavenly beings? Heavenly beings, you mean, are they holy and righteous? <laughs> some are and some are not, believe me. 
And these are people who are intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. Well, how can you make such an accusation against a dear, sweet, humble brother in Christ who's saying to you that, you know, that God showed him and that the angel stood behind him. I was in a church in uh, Amsterdam where a person said that the angel Gabriel stood behind him and put his hand on his shoulder for, I forget, a couple days or something like that and revealed and told him all these things which he wrote down. And he didn't have time to tell you, but you could go to the back desk and buy the DVD or buy the CD of everything that was written down in case you wanted to know. And uh, this is garbage. How can I say that? How can I be so mean and cruel and heartless? Because it doesn't hold the head from which all the body by joints and bands having nourishment ministered and knit together increases with the increase of God. Okay, if it doesn't, if it's not about Jesus, see you later. Thank you very much. I don't need it. Okay, so if it, if, it, if it is from God, then recognize the theology that's being packed into uh, these few verses here. Don't touch that. Don't taste this. Don't, don't handle that. Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth. Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, covetousness, which is idolatry, for which things sake the wrath of God comes upon the children of disobedience. So you want to get rid of things out of your life? Why don't you try some of those? Why don't you stop lying? Why don't you stop fornicating? Why don't you get rid of uncleanliness? Why don't you drop inordinate affection? Why don't you get rid of evil concupiscence? Um, why don't you stop coveting things? Well, that's something we could do. <laughs> yeah, like we really want to do those. Well, for which things sake the wrath of God comes upon the children of disobedience. You know, my worst day as a Christian was honestly, is honestly so much better than my best day as a non-Christian. And the sacrificing we make, we don't make by ourselves. We do it by the power of the Holy Spirit. Paul says that we should offer ourselves as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto him, which is our reasonable service. There are a lot of things that we can put off that really, and I don't mean to say that everything has to be for our benefit. I know it, there's kind of an undercurrent that you should not do this because it's not good for you, you, you. Well, I'd like to say Again, it's not about you, 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 or me, me, me. Yes, I do get the benefit, okay? You put off these things, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, com uh, filthy communication out of your mouth, lie not to Nigh, lie not one to another, seeing that you put off the old man with his deeds. Oh yes, this is for your benefit. You will feel so much better about yourself. You know what? doesn't matter what I feel. What matters is God doesn't accept this. And these things invoke the wrath of God. Whether you feel good about you or whether you don't feel good about you, get off of you. Anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communications out of your mouth. Stop lying one to another. Stop your anger. Stop your malice. Stop your blasphemy. Stop your filthy communication. Quit it. God doesn't like it. Seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds. But when we put that off, we put off a new man that is made in the knowledge after the image of him that created him, and that's Jesus. And it doesn't matter. You put on Jesus whether you're a Greek, whether you're a Jew. It doesn't matter. Barbarian, Scythian, bond or free. Christ is all in all. All you ever need to find is in Christ, regardless of your, your race, your gender. It doesn't matter. Everything you need is in Jesus and in all. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, beloved, bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, forgiving one another. So think about these things that we could actually do 
I mean, for people that are seeking special initiations, how about being merciful? Instead of memorizing, you know, dead poet society information or something like that. How about kindness? Be kind one to another instead of, you know, eating with a cool hand Luke and prison ate all those hard-boiled eggs. I mean, why don't you be kind instead? Humbleness of mind, meekness. Meekness, by the way, is not timidness. Meekness is teachability. Why don't you, instead of thinking that you know it all, at least listen, consider meekness is teachableness. I said teachability, it's teachableness. How teachable are you? is how meek you are. Moses was the meekest man in all the world. He could be taught. When Korah came against him, he said, okay, well, let's see whether or not God wants me to instruct these people, whether or not you're supposed to have a part in this. He said, we'll just leave it up to God. He was teachable. He didn't fight and argue. He said, okay, let's see. A mind that is humbleness of mind and meekness is somebody that's willing to look at the evidence and consider not just, be, not just being a totalitarian about everything. Well, it's because I say so. Okay. Anyway, those are attitudes that only God can work out of us. Long-suffering. You mean still? Yeah, still. How about my life? If G- I got saved July 5th, 1968. If Jesus had not been long-suffering and come July 4th, 1968, I'd be pop-sizzling, frying, burning, suffering, screaming in hell right now, but because long suffering, he waited a little bit longer. That's a good thing. That's a wonderful thing. We should try to take it up ourselves. Okay. Forbearing one another, forgiving one another. If any man has a quarrel against another, uh, against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. Okay. This is putting on and above all, these things put on charity. This is putting on charity, which is the bond of perfectness, or we become mature. Let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also you're called in one body. Be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell rich you. You know, ditch Cahill Gibran and uh, and your Quran and Hadith and, and, uh, you know, get rid of, you know, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. Wisdom, by the way, um, is always spoken of in scripture as a feminine gender because she produces, okay? And all wisdom means wisdom is what produces, is what actually brings forth. Women bring forth children. That's why wisdom is a feminine gender all the time. Teaching and ad- admonishing one another in psalms and hymns, spiritual psalm- songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever you do in wo- word or deed, do it in the name of the Lord Jesus. If you can't do it for him, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. If you can't do it for the Lord, then do we really need to be doing it at all? I don't care if you're digging holes or shining shoes. Can you not, you know, I'm going to make the best hole. This is going to be, I'm going to go around the soles of this shoe with a toothbrush because I'm doing this for Jesus. I'm not doing this for anybody else. I'm going to do it as, un- it's a wonderful way to live your life. Okay. Now he comes into relationships, which whether you realize it or not, I just mentioned. Okay. Number one, our relationship with God. And uh, number two are relationships with others. And Paul is going to make a list here, Colossians. Listen up. Wives, submit yourselves unto your husbands. So he's going to say wives and husbands. And then he's going to say husbands and wives. And then he's going to say children and parents. And then he's going to say parents and children. And then he's going to say slaves and masters. And then he's going to say masters and slaves. He is not producing a pecking order here, a list of priorities or who's subordinate and who is insubordinate. If God wanted to be a totalitarian, we would not be having this conversation at all, period. Okay, you wives, you submit yourselves unto your own husbands as it is fit in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. There is something coming forth called relationship, and it's reciprocal, and there is accountability before God with it, okay? When my wife does something for me, she does it as is fit in the Lord, not because I'm the totalitarian head of the home, and she's going to, you know, suffer frog bumps if she disobeys her husband, Okay, husbands, love your wives, be not bitter. This is a reciprocal heart 
agreement. Children, obey your parents in all things. They should. Well, guess what? Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. Don't make it hard for them. Get off your high horse and have a little... Have a bond of charity. Put on charity. Charity is love. Put on love. Servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. Okay, I'm a servant. I'm going to be the best servant I can be, not because of my master, because he deserves it or he's going to punish me if I don't, but because I'm, I'm, I'm here for Jesus. I live every breath I take. I take for him, okay? This is all about Jesus in my life. So whatever you do, do it heartily as unto the Lord and not unto men. Men might get the benefit of a good job, but you're doing it as unto the Lord, knowing that of the Lord you shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ, okay? Now, he that does wrong is going to receive for the wrong which he has done, whether it's uh, wife Husband abuse, husband wife abuse, children parent abuse, parent children abuse, slave master abuse, master slave abuse, whatever it is, nobody escapes. He that does wrong shall receive for the Lord or for the wrong which he has done, and there is no respect of persons. Okay. God doesn't favor well because you're the boss, I'm gonna let it slide. You shouldn't have done it, but okay. God does not have any respect of persons. Masters, given to your servants that which is just and equal. You can't cheat them. You're not, don't, don't, don't treat them as lower than you. That which is just and equal. We're not talking about egalitarian equal pay or, or distribution of wealth here. We're talking about equal before God. Okay, the slave has just, when he comes before the throne of God, he doesn't come at a lower standard or stature or state than you do, Master, knowing that you also have a Master in heaven. So continue in prayer and watch into the same with thanksgiving and uh, with all praying also for us. Paul is, Paul is getting a clue as to where he's headed with his prison. He was released after his first time, and then he was, uh, he was recaptured again or put back in prison, probably because of the uproar at, um, at Athens. Uh, Alexander the coppersmith had done him much harm. Um, well, he says that God would put a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am also in bonds, that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. Okay, walk in wisdom toward them that are without, redeeming the time. Take advantage of every minute of every day, whatever you're doing, whatever project you're getting on, does it have a priority? Okay, is God in it? Let your speech be always seasoned with grace. People look at you. People judge your words. Your words are powerful. How forcible are right words like apples of gold and pictures of silver. Let them be seasoned with salt uh, that ye may know how ye ought to answer every man. You should have a reason for the hope that lies within you. Uh, all my state shall Tychicus declare unto you. And here we go into a list of things which we may or may not uh, go Tychicus shall declare unto you he carried the letter <coughs> to um, Laodicea or the letter of the Ephesians and um, he was also going to Hierapolis and to Laodicea and to uh, Colossae. Colossae. Okay, so Tychicus declare unto you who is a beloved brother, a faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord, whom I have sent unto you for the same purpose, that he might know your estate and comfort your hearts with Onesimus. Okay, he's another one carrying the letter here. Uh, not only does he carry the letter to the, uh, the Colossians, he's carrying the letter to Philemon, his master, who, by the way, has the power, the legal authority to have him put to death because he's a runaway slave. But Paul, who was accused of being pro-slavery by um, ignoramuses, is simply instructing Philemon, receive him as a brother, love him, have a heart, give him a break. We're Christians. Look what Jesus did for us. I don't mention to you how that you owe me your life. Well, if, if you're going to repay, then here's a good place to do it. Receive him with an open heart, with open arms, with open arms, and love him as a brother. Take Onesimus back, okay, who is one of you. Uh, he says that about Tychicus and Onesimus, they shall, make, they shall make known unto you all things which are done here. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, salutes you, and Marcus, sister son to Barnabas. That always confused me. That means he's a cousin. 
<laughs> and this is John Mark, is we can dig through Scripture and find out, but I'll spare you now. Touching whom you receive commandments, if he come unto you, receive John Mark, okay? They were in good standing at this time. There was a time when John Mark separated. If you've studied the Pauline um, missionary journeys, and uh, there was a time when Paul said to Barnabas, I don't think we need to bring them. Sharp contention, and they separated, but that hasn't happened yet at this time. And also a Jew who is called Justice, uh, who are of the circumcision, that means that he's Jewish, and these only are my fellow workers under the kingdom of God, which have been a comfort unto me. Epaphras, who is one of you, he's the founder of your church, he's from from Colossae. Uh, he's one of you. He's a servant of Jesus Christ. He salutes you, always laboring for you. And Paul is giving a, a shout out here, a recommendation for him. He's saying, this guy prays for you that you might stand perfect and complete in all the will of God, for I bear him record. I'm not, I, I see him on his knees. He has a great zeal for you and to them that are in Laodicea and to them in Hierapolis. Luke, the beloved physician, who we know from the gospel of Luke in the book of Acts, he's also here as a matter of fact, I think 2 Timothy uh, chapter 4, at the end of Paul's life, he says, Luke only is with me. So Luke, Luke was a sticker. He was a person who stuck, stuck out. He stuck with his friends, okay? He was not a payday friend. Uh, Luke, Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas um, greet you. At this time, Demas is with Paul and everything's okay. Later, we read that Demas, having loved this present evil world, he went back to Thessalonica. Okay, but now they're greeting you. Salute the brethren, and uh, which are in Laodicea, and Nymphus, and the church which is in his house. It may be a, a, a family, Nymphus with an S on it, could be plural, or it could be just a single guy. But anyway, there's a church in his house, okay? And when this epistle is read among you, cause it to be read also in the church of the Laodiceans, and that ye likewise read the epistle from Laodicea. Well, we do not have a letter of the Apostle Paul to the church of at Laodicea. That's why it's possible and probable that uh, this is the Ephesians church. It was sort of the capital of the area of that valley there, okay? And uh, say to Archippus, who um, was there at this time, take heed of the ministry which thou hast received from the Lord, that you fulfill it. And the reason I kind of hesitate on Archippus is he may have been the son of um, Philemon, because in Paul's letter to Philemon, he mentions Archippus, and Philemon was not a general letter. It was not an, uh, uh, in, in, an occasioned letter. It was a very personal letter that Paul wrote to Philemon, and he mentions Archippus there. Greet him. Say hi. Probably his son, quite possibly his son, but whether he was or not, I guess is really <laughs> irrelevant on planet earth, okay? Uh, but Paul is saying, take heed. God's given you a ministry. Be faithful and walk in it. And then at the end, he said, the salutation uh, by the hand of me, Paul, remember my bonds. Grace be with you. Amen. The salutation of me, Paul, means that it was dictated, which was probably Tychicus who who wrote down what Paul was speaking. And, uh, but Paul would sign the letter because earlier in the game, people were passing around letters saying that they were from the Apostle Paul and they were not from the Apostle Paul. They were counterfeits. They were false letters saying, oh, here I got a letter from Paul. He said yada yada, and he never said that at all. So it became sort of a, a safeguard for Paul to sign a letter with his own hand so that you could take his signature, put it in your signature card file, and pull it out and say, yeah, this is his signature okay? And uh, you could accept or validate or give credibility to the letter. Okay, and Paul ends, grace be with you, amen. And it was written from Rome under his uh, first house arrest. And then Onesimus and uh, Tychicus were out the door with it, bringing this letter to the Colossians. Think about it, pray about it, read it often. There's an awful lot of really important issues covered in this. Jesus is the only name given among men under heaven whereby we must be saved.